what happened to cause this incredible 23 minutes that changed your life? You know, Pastor Phil, this message is really so important, not because of my experience, but because of the eternal consequences for the decision. If people reject Jesus Christ, they really have no idea what they're facing. Mm. Hell is so severe. If anybody could see it for five seconds, mm. it would change their life. Right. That's why Jesus came was a plan across right in the middle of that road that we're all on. Amen. So all we have to do is look up to the cross. He'll take us off that road. One second after we die, it's too late. The only opportunity people have is right now while they're alive. You have to choose now. Choose life. I don't care what you're raised with. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you will end up in this place for all eternity. That's horrible to contemplate. It is. It's horrible. Ninety, uh, over 90 percent of the people in America walking the street today believe in God, but only four percent believe in hell. Right. And only two percent believe they're going to go there. Right. You, and some people think, well, can't God let somebody out of hell after a couple hundred years or so? But see, that yeah. works. Time is the wrong premise. It has nothing to do with time. It's to do with relationships. See, that's powerful. The fear level in hell is so intense. It's so far beyond anything I can describe. I felt completely isolated, uh, lonely, hopeless. Hell is a real place. You want to avoid it at all costs. I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me, but he rose again and lives forevermore. This decision is too serious. Make your way down to the front. That's the hands all over. Give Jesus the praise tonight. How many's glad tonight for Bill Weiss and we're still coming. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I am now a born again Christian. Let's rejoice in Jesus name. I'm going to ask you at the count of three to raise your hand. So I'd like for you to pray for you that are at this altar. This is about as scripturally sound that I, I've, I've ever heard in my entire life. That's why Jesus warned about hell. 46 verses, he warned us. And 18 of those verses are about the fires of hell. I'm going to ask you to get out of your seat and come down to the front. Anybody that raised their hand or... Amen. 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 Praise Amen. God. Amen. This is the, the clearest presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ that I have ever heard in almost 40 years of being a believer in Jesus, a Christian. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people are going. It's something about taking a stand for God. When you walk out of your seat and you come forward, you're showing him, I mean business, I'm not doing this half-heartedly. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. Can we tell Bill Weiss how much we love and appreciate him bringing us truth from God's Word today? I don't serve God because I'm afraid of hell. I serve him because he's the most wonderful person you'll ever meet, Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we're honored to be here again. And uh, before I get into sharing the good part about meeting Jesus, I'm just going to do a quick recap of my experience, uh, just a five minute or so for anybody that's here that might not have heard my experience about 23 minutes in hell. Uh, this was a vision. This was not a near-death experience. I had an out-of-body experience that would be classified as a vision. In 2 Corinthians 12, 1 and 2, Paul, when he was caught up into heaven in a vision, he said, whether in the body or out of the body, he didn't know. Well, the Lord showed me that I left my body. So you can understand that in a vision, you can travel like Paul and John actually traveled to heaven in their spirit bodies. And in Job 7, 14, he says, you scare me with dreams and terrify me through visions. So you can't have a terrifying vision. That's what this was. And... Um, we went to a prayer meeting Sunday night, like we attended every Sunday night, nothing unusual about the night. Came home, went to bed. I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning just to get a glass of water, and I was pulled out of my body, like being drawn up out of your body. Now, I never had a vision like this before. I've never gone to dark movies. I've never drank. I've never taken drugs and so forth, but I was pulled out of my body, and I found myself falling through the air down this long tunnel, and it was getting hotter and hotter, and I landed on a stone floor in a prison cell in hell. Rough-hewn stone walls and bars, just like you would imagine, but more like a dungeon. 
It was filthy, stinking, dirty, smoke-filled dungeon. I had no idea how I got there or why I was there. Nothing was explained until the way back. The Lord explained on the way back what had happened. Uh, but I knew where I was. There's no question about when you're in hell. There's no place like it. And the heat was so far beyond the ability to sustain life, I wondered, first of all, why am I alive? I should be dead. And face down the floor in this prison cell, rough hewn stone walls and bars, like you would imagine. And I, I wanted to get up and run, but I had no physical strength whatsoever. But see, strength comes from God. And you have no strength in hell at all. Uh, There's demons that came into the cell. They grabbed me. They tore at my flesh, ripped the flesh open. You have a body in hell, but it withstands these torments. I noticed there was no blood or water coming from the wounds, but Leviticus 17:11 says the life of the flesh is in the blood. Well, there's no life in hell, so there's no blood, and there's no water, not one drop of water. And there are demons that absolutely have an extreme hatred for you, and they have no mercy whatsoever over you, absolutely none. But see, Psalms 103, 17 says, The mercy of the Lord is upon those that fear him. Well, they don't fear him in hell, so you don't derive the benefit of mercy. And about this time it went dark. I believed it was God's presence to illuminate it so I could see. But then it resumed its normal state. And it is pitch black in hell. You cannot see anything, not the hand in front of your face. And I shared this in the first service. I was at, in Arizona, went to the coal mines, and they bring you down real deep into the ground uh, to, uh, as a tourist, you know, as people, they take you through a tour. And they turn off the lights when you get down deep in the earth for about a minute. And you cannot believe the panic that happens over people. Everybody starts screaming and goes frantic in one minute because it's really strange to be in darkness where you cannot see anything, not your hand in front of your face. It's pitch black. And there's a terror that comes over you. You can't see your way out, you, nothing. And that's just one minute of darkness. So it's interesting. I, I observed that when I was there. But hell, you're in this darkness for all eternity. I was taken out of this prison cell uh, after these demons tried to torment me and did other things. I was placed next, next to this large raging pit of fire. And I had the understanding that this pit was about a mile across with flames raging high up into this open cavern. This is where I could first see people. There were thousands of people inside this pit burning and screaming. And you could not distinguish a man from a woman. There's just an outline. It looked like skeletons with flesh hanging off their bones. And demons were shoving people back in. They were screaming. And the screams are so loud and deafening. I wish I could... Uh, have you hear just a little bit of what it's like in hell the, the sound it's so loud that you want to get away from that if you had to just endure that for eternity that would torment you and but you're hearing thousands of people screaming uh, in agony and burning and so you want to get away from that but you have to endure that for all eternity and uh, there's um, these demons that have great strength you have none you can't defend yourself against them uh, I understood I was down deep in the earth. I descended to get there. I ascended when I left. But more importantly, there's 49 scriptures that talk about where hell is. And I understood there were different levels of torment and degrees of punishment. But all the levels are horrendous beyond anything you can imagine. And uh, I wanted to talk to my wife, but I understood I'll never get to do that. You under Job 7.9 says, He that goes down to Sheol shall come up no more. You never get that opportunity to talk to anybody. You're completely isolated and by yourself. So you have no conversation with anyone ever again. And you understand you'll never get to say goodbye to your family. And that's really tormenting to have no finality with your family. You don't realize that either because they don't know that you still exist. Death does not mean cease to exist. Death means separation from God. You still exist. You're just down deep in the earth suffering. And um, the stench in hell is the most foul, putrid. The demons have this disgusting, foul odor to them. And also the smell of burning flesh and burning sulfur. And, you know, if you go to Hawaii, to Hawaii, they have signs posted, you cannot go past a certain point at the volcano because the toxic smell of the sulfur coming up, it's, it will kill you. Well, sulfur is just another word for brimstone. You're breathing in this foul, putrid air, but there's not enough air to breathe in hell either. So, you know, only an asthma patient can even relate, but you can't breathe hardly in hell, and so you feel like you're going to suffocate in any moment. You have to endure that for all eternity. And I looked and I saw maggots crawling all over everything and everybody and snakes. And there were demons of all different sizes and shapes, twisted, deformed, and grotesque. They're the most hideous creatures. Now, I could only see through the flames when I was standing alone in this pit. 
just through them and along the edges. It's so dark, the light does not travel in hell. It's just, you can see through it a little bit. It's hard to describe that part. But there's a scripture that explains that. But the point is, all I could see was these demons and um, snakes and maggots. Disgusting maggots crawling all over people. And as I was looking at all this horror and uh, feeling like, I'll never, I'll never get out of here. See, this was the worst part, was understanding the hopelessness that people have in hell. And here we can't grasp what it's like to be totally hopeless. Because even if you're in absolute severe pain, you at least know you can die to get out of the pain. You have that in your mind. But in hell, you know you'll never get out of the pain. There's not going to be anybody can rescue you. And see, we can't grasp that. You really can't grasp all eternity in agony. And see, that's, what, that's the worst part of hell, is understanding you'll never get out. Isaiah 38, 18 says, Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. And we know Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They have no hope for him because it's too late. And that was the worst part. Besides being separated from God and life, and we don't even know what that's like to be really separated from life. See, God is involved in every cell in our body. Every cell division, everything that's going on, it's life in your body. In hell, it's death. And so you're completely separated from any kind of life whatsoever. It's really hard to describe that also, what it's like to be dead. Um, you know, I saw, remember in this, the movie Titanic, and it showed the ship all beautiful and white, and you know, but then it showed it, uh, they had a scene where it just flashed into it underneath the ocean. And it showed the same ship, but it was dead. It was rested, uh, uh, just a hull. And it, so it looked so, you know, there was no life in it. It was just, that's how you are in hell. It's like, there's no life. You're just a dead hull compared to the ship beautiful up on the surface, you know. And they that described that. Or it's like a negative, a piece of negative film. You look at it you know, if you, photography, and, uh, you know, it's, there's no life in it, and there's no color. It's just dead. It's the image, but it's not like a picture, a color photo. It's kind of like that, but anyway, these are all the things that you have to endure in hell, and this is forever. You'll never get out, and the fear that you're experiencing, too, that's another thing, is that fear level never goes away, and, you know, to experience fear is torment, like the Bible said. So to have a, if you're ever in a spot where you are really terrified, uh, maybe you were in a car accident, and right before the moment of impact, when <gasps> you jump, that fear jumped up in your throat, well, if you can take that times a thousand and keep it there for all eternity. And so you're experiencing that also in hell. You know, Psalm 73, 18 and 19 says, you cast them down into destruction where they are utterly consumed with terror. You're consumed with this terror forever. Well, at this time, I was looking at all this horror, and I was beneath this tunnel, and along the cavern walls were demons of all different sizes and shapes, twisted to form. I could only see a little bit, but then something began raising me up this tunnel in this absolute pitch black darkness. And then suddenly, in this dark tunnel, this bright light appeared. I knew immediately who it was. I had no doubt in my mind. When Jesus shows up, there's no question who he is. None. And uh, I, I, I didn't see his face. I just saw the outline of a man standing in a bright, pure, holy light. I'd never seen a light like that before. It was so pure. Not like a light that we see on the earth. Uh, it, it's just hard to describe the light that's around him. It's beautiful. And it's so bright, but you can look at it. And I just couldn't see his features. But I just called out his name. I said, Jesus. And he said, I am. And when he said, I am, I went out. I, I honestly don't know if I died or just passed out. But Revelation 116, John said when he saw him, his countenance was bright as the sun, and I fell at his feet as one dead. Well, after time, he touched me. And it hit me so strongly, even though at that point, I'd been a Christian for 28 years. And it hit me at his feet that if he wouldn't have gone to the cross, I would be in that place for all eternity. I'm telling you, I was so grateful for the cross. Because see, one second ago, I was in hell forever. My mind was at that point. You understand that you'll never get out. Now, all of a sudden, he placed it back in my mind that I was a Christian. And I didn't have to go to that place. 
I was so grateful from one extreme to the other. I just said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. I love you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That's all I wanted to say, continue. And I did that for a while, I suppose. Then after a time, those thoughts started coming to my mind. And he would answer my thoughts. I didn't want to ask him any questions. You just want to worship him. You do not want to ask him anything in his presence. I just wanted to say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But he would answer my thoughts. And Psalms 139 too says he answers our thoughts afar so off. I thought, Lord, why did you send me to this horrible place? He said, because many people do not believe hell is real. He said, even some of my own people do not believe hell exists. Now, at the, at the time, I was surprised at that statement. I thought, Lord, but don't all Christians believe in hell? But we found out since many don't. They believe in a teaching called annihilationism, and that's a false teaching uh, that says that if you deny Jesus, you simply cease to exist. But that's not true. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46, these shall go into everlasting life, and these shall go into everlasting punishment. He used the word everlasting, the same word, Ionios, describing heaven as everlasting, so is hell everlasting. Many more verses about hell being everlasting, and you'll thank God he saved you from that horrible place. And I thought, Lord, why did those demons hate me so much? They have an extreme hatred for mankind. He said, because you're made in my image, and they hate me. See, John 15, 18, Jesus said they hated me before they hated you. Demons hate God, but they can't hurt him, but they can hurt his creation. That's why Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But he said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. See, the devil is the one doing the destruction. Sickness, disease, poverty, all those things, that comes from the demonic realm. But we serve a good God that came to give us life. I thought, Lord, why did you pick me? But he never gave me an answer. He just remained silent. I thought I stumped him, you know, for a minute. Like, or Lord, I wanted to say, Lord, you know, you made a mistake. I am the wrong guy for this. But mistake and God, those two words don't go too well together, you know. But it doesn't matter why. He's given us all something to do. We're all equally important. There's no big shots with God. I, and I thought, Lord, I don't want to tell anybody about this experience. They're going to think I'm crazy. He said, it's not your job to convict their hearts. That's the Holy Spirit's. He said, you just go and tell them. I said, yes, sir. I'll go. But I have to admit, after I got back from this experience, I didn't want to tell anybody about it. I wanted to witness to everything that moved, but I didn't want to share this experience. And so I was reluctant. I shared it with one close friend. It spread from there, and he asked me to come to his Bible study. Three months later, I went reluctantly, and then it spread all around the country. And so my wife and I started getting invited everywhere. And we would take her two days off a week and her vacation time. And we would travel. We paid our own way. We never took any money from anybody for seven years. And then the publisher came to us, asked us to write the book. So that's where the book came from. They asked us. But I was happy to write the book because I placed in there all the scriptures that have to do with what I saw. And that's what's important for you to believe. It's not important for you to believe me. It's just important to believe the word of God. Because a lot of churches aren't teaching the truth about the Word of God today. And there's a, that belief of annihilationism or universalism, a teaching that says everybody gets saved, or soul sleep, many false teachings. And the Scripture is so clear, but people don't point out the Word or don't value the Word. So it's important for us to know. That's why it's good to go to a church that teaches the whole counsel of God. Amen. And when you understand, when you understand how severe hell is like this, when you grasp it, see, it's not a negative message. It's a message of love because it's a message of warning. And when you can grasp it, then you are, number one, more appreciative of your own salvation. You walk more in the fear of the Lord, and you'll have more of a passion for the lost. That's why it's important for you as Christians to hear about hell. I thought, Lord, why didn't I know you? Now, I didn't explain to you that God blocked it from my mind that I was a Christian. He hid that fact from me. There's scripture I can give you for that in the Bible, but I'll keep moving. And see, if I was there as a Christian, which I was, but I didn't know, I would have known, praise God, he's getting me out of here. Thank you, Jesus, for getting me out of here. As a Christian, we know our destiny is heaven. But he wanted me to experience what they feel, hopelessness. That is the worst part because they understand they're not going to get out. No one's going to come rescue. They grasp that. And they grasp eternity, that there is time doesn't end. Like we think of time as a beginning and an end. But in hell, you can grasp it that it never ends. You can imagine now why this decision is so important for people to make. 
One second after they die, it's too late. They don't get a second chance. So that's what he wanted me to, to remember, the hopelessness. And that, that is the worst part of hell. I thought, Lord, those demons were so powerful because they were, they were huge and they look so vicious and they are and mean. But when Jesus said to him, he goes, all you have to do is cast them out in my name. He said it so calmly. I thought, that's right. We have authority over the demonic realm. You know, it hit me so strongly, the authority that we do carry as Christians. Yes, demons are powerful in the natural, but as with your spirit filled and you know Jesus Christ, you know your authority, those demons are no match. And then I took a second look. This actually happened that I started looking at the demons that were on the walls. We were ascending up, we were moving, and there were demons along the wall, but all of a sudden they looked like ants. They appeared to be the size of ants. I don't understand this. I can't explain it. I just remember stooping over like this and looking again like, why are they so little now? Now, if, because Jesus showed up, number one. But I believe that it was because that he was allowing me to see the authority we have over the demonic realm. Those creatures are nothing compared to the name of Jesus. They're like an ant. You step on an ant and you wouldn't even give it a thought. You know, we'll trample on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. So that's what God was trying to get across to me. You have great authority in my name. Those demons are nothing. Just cast them out. And that gave me that kind of, you know, wow, this is exciting to be a Christian, you know, and so forth. But anyway, uh, as we're ascending up this tunnel, we came out of this tunnel, and it was a whirlwind. There's scripture for all this, too, uh, but... This tunnel that came out of hell is like a whirlwind, and it went above the earth. And we came out of the tunnel, and now I look back at the earth, and we were out in space, and the earth looked like, like an astronaut would see it. So I look back, and I saw, wow, look at the earth. Job 26, 7 says, he hangeth the earth upon nothing. And it was just hung. It looked like it was hung on nothing. What's holding it up? And I thought, what's making it turn? And it was turning so precisely. You know, it turns at 1,000 miles an hour and doesn't vary one mile per hour. Every day, it's exact. And I was just observing all that. I thought, wow, look at that. That's amazing. I don't know how you wouldn't get saved as an astronaut seeing that. I really don't. God's glorious creation to see it from space. And, you know, when I was young, I, I wanted to be an astronaut. I believe God remembered that. And he took me, you know, he didn't have to take the scenic route home, you know. <laughs> but he did that for me, to get to see the earth from space. How many people have seen the earth from space? A handful, right? It's really something to see it, God's beautiful creation. I was enjoying all that. And these are thoughts that were in my mind at the time. The Lord's right next to me. And I was thinking, Lord, look how big the oceans are. They're massive. All that water, and they're not spilling onto the land. But yet it's spinning at 1,000 miles an hour. And I thought, you can't even carry a bowl of water across the room without spilling it. You ever try it? Fill it up and try to carry it. It spills so easy. And God has the oceans because he commanded the oceans to stay put. I mean, you go down to the beach and look and you see that water stays there every day. It doesn't move. That huge body, God's controlling all that. And I thought, oh, man, Lord, you are something to carry. Then I turned around and looked at the universe. And I could grasp a little more than we can here how many stars there are and planets. There, it's countless. I mean, there's, there's, there's not even a number for them. Trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions. And the Bible says he has a name for every one of them. Can you imagine? He's named the trillions of stars and all that. And I was looking at it and saying, look at the control. Not one is colliding. Not one's out of orbit. Every one of those trillions he is controlling. At the same time, he understands every thought that's in our mind. Every person, seven billion people, all having thoughts constantly, and he knows every thought that's in your mind all the time. And he's orchestrating things that happen in your life for your benefit. He's, he's orchestrating all this. At the same time, he's running the whole show, controlling the whole world and everything else. And then it says he even knows every hair on our head. I mean, can you imagine how many hairs are on your head and everybody is changing every day? And God knows all this. I thought, we serve a big God. Amen? And I thought, man, we wonder, can the Lord answer my prayer? This is a pretty big one. This is pretty tough, you know? <laughs> there is no tough thing for God. I mean, none. I mean, he is so big. 
You know, it says his hand spans the universe. I mean, how, they don't even know how big the universe is. It's endless. And his hand spans. Anyway, I was enjoying all that, but he, he had me turn around and look at this whirlwind tunnel that we came out of. And people were falling one after another after another back down that tunnel. And he allowed me to feel peace of his heart. And he wept because of the anguish he feels for his soul falling into hell. And I said, Lord, I cannot stand to feel even a fraction of the anguish you feel for a person going to hell. See, we love our family members greatly, but that's no comparison to how much God loves us. Ephesians 3.19 says his love passes knowledge. He loves us far more than you can imagine. And I shared this in the first service, but I think it just gets you a little bit more understanding. You know, he opened up the scripture, Psalms 139, 17, and 18 to me. And, you know, where David said, your thoughts toward me are all precious. And I suppose if I should count them, they are more than the sands. And other places say more than the sands on the whole earth. So th now this, we read that glibly and think, oh, that's nice. But no, think about this. He said, look, if you picked up a handful of sand, there'd be thousands of granules in your hand. And if each one represented a thought, a good thought, and you saw me take this handful of sand and I took one grain at a time and I said, I love how my wife prays for me all the time. I love how beautiful she is. I love how she loves her parents. And I love how she prays for everyone. And you came back three or four hours from now and I'm trying to exhaust the amount in my hand. You would say Bill has really gone over his wife. He's crazy about her, right? That's just to exhaust the amount in my hand. And God says his thoughts are more precious than all the sands on the whole earth. How many granules are on the whole earth? Countless. And it's not an exaggeration because God can't exaggerate. So that's how much. Can you grasp a little bit more how much he loves each person and doesn't want to see one person go to hell? That's how valuable you are to God. That's unfathomable to me, how much God can love that, with that degree for everybody. I want, I, he allowed me to, to feel that. And that was really the best part of this whole experience was feeling a piece of God's heart. That really is what stuck with me the most, how much he loves us. I thought, Lord, I must have thought this thought, and he answered it uh, about witnessing. I just thought something about witnessing. And he said, you know, many of my people make excuses why they don't witness. They say, I didn't feel led. Now, I've said that before. And I know we have to be led, but most people make excuses. And Jesus even said, he goes, it's because they fear man rather than fearing God. Man, that cuts. Because, you know, we all have opportunities to share the word of God. And many times we don't take those opportunities. But yet that's what we're all called to do. Jesus said to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And he said he's entrusted us with the gospel. In other words, he's given us his words. He has entrusted us with the words of life. That's a privilege. It's like when you're young and your parents entrust you with driving the car. You think, well, they trust me to not wreck the car. Well, God has entrusted us with the precious gospel because it's words of life that can change someone's eternity. That's a privilege that we all have. And we should all be about the Father's business and take every opportunity we can to witness. And when you understand how severe hell is, see, you will think, I don't want my family going there. I don't want my friends going there. I've got to do more than I normally would do. See, we kind of just shove it off. Well, maybe now you'll fast and pray. Maybe now you'll really watch for those opportunities. You'll be more diligent to be a better witness for God. Okay? And, and like Charles Spurgeon said, 90% of our witness is through our life example. Do we show up on time? Do we keep our word to our own hurt? Are we quick to forgive people that are mean and ugly to us? Do we show love to people that are ugly to us? Do we guard our tongue? And we, this is all done in front of unsaved people. See, they observe us, and they see how you act. And, but that's a really good witness. When you are doing things the way God would have you to do, they notice you. They will notice. I could tell you many stories about people that uh, have entrusted me because they observed me. And then I got the chance to witness to them. So that's most of our witness, but also we are to share the truth, the word of God, take the opportunity. And you know what? It's not hard. We got the easy part. We're just a delivery boy to deliver the message. 
God has the hard part to, to chisel at their heart and woke up on their, their heart and their minds to see the truth of the word. We just have to go tell them. And you'd be surprised. Most people are willing to listen. Yes, some will ridicule and push you away and make fun of you. But you know, it's kind of like a fireman. If you, a fireman gets used to, if he wants to save somebody, he's got to put up with the heat. He's got to feel the scorch. The same with us as Christians. We're going to have to be a little tough on our exterior. If you want to be a good witness, soul winner, you got to be able to put up with some ridicule and not let it just let it slide off your back. You know, because again, we're the delivery boy. Amen? The last thing the Lord said to me was, tell them I am coming very, very soon. And he repeated himself. He said, tell them I'm coming very, very soon. Now, I wish I would have asked him, Lord, what, what soon do you, you know? <laughs> but honestly, I felt in my heart that we don't have a lot of time. And that was 1998. But you know, I feel that God has extended the time. It said he delays his coming. He's delayed it purposely so more people can get saved. And that's the time we're in right now. I believe we're in that delay window. We have a window of opportunity right now to witness. And especially now we have a president that will has this door open that we can witness. It's a little better time right now. We have more of an opportunity. We need to take advantage of that, honestly. And um, as we came up to our home, we came back traveling through the atmosphere, and we came up to my home, and I could view my body lying on the floor. I, I could see right through the roof. And I thought, that's not me. That's the real me. This is the real me. That was so temporal. The body looked so temporal. It looked just like your car. It's a vehicle to get you around in life, but it's not you. The real you is, see, so the spirit man is the real man. And one other thing I experienced being with the Lord, you know how we're always in a rush here, right? Time, even now, we're almost out, you know, we're always in, I got time. Well, time was removed. The burden of time was lifted when I was with the Lord. And it was so um, peaceful to think, See, time is a commodity that there is no end of in heaven. It's not like you, you're going to be out of time. You have all the time. You have eternity. And so there's no pressure or burden of time whatsoever in heaven. And we have no idea what that's like either because that weight is always on us. We're always in a hurry. We always got stuff to do. We got to keep moving. But in heaven, it's not like that. So it felt like a person carrying a barbell around and somebody grabbed it off your back. That's how it felt when, the, when I was with the Lord. These little things, I'm just trying to share with you how I felt, you know, and things that I, he allowed me to feel. And, um, you know, we, when we came up to our, my, my body, I entered back into my body. I felt like I came in through my mouth or my nose. I, I'm not sure which one. But when I came back in, then the horrors of hell flooded back into my mind. See, when I was traveling back with the Lord, 1 John 4, 18 says, perfect love casts out fear. I had no fear whatsoever. But when he left, the memories of hell came back to my mind. And, and it's so severe seeing hell it will kill you. And I started dying. This was when I was in the most, best physical shape of my life. I had working out like, and I was younger, and I was really healthy and strong, and I felt like I'm going to die. I've got, so I screamed after my wife, pray for me, pray for me. The Lord has taken me to hell. Pray that God removes this from me. So she prayed, and God removed the horror, but he left the memory. Now, how can he do that? But he can divide both soul and spirit, so he can do anything, but he took away the horror, and I would have died. And the first thing I did was ask for a glass of water. <laughs> and, you know, it was so beautiful to see water. Because, see, Revelation 21.6 equates water with life. Water is life. And I said, wow, that's life in a glass. So there's no life in hell. There is no life in hell. So to see it all contained in one little glass, it was so beautiful and precious. See, it's hard for you to relate to that even because, you know, you get used to water. Well, d <laughs> drink water. It's good for you. <laughs> And appreciate it. Appreciate it. You don't, in hell, you don't just think that rich man Jesus talked about. Remember the rich man? He wanted one drop of water that he'll never get. Now, we wouldn't value one drop, would we? But in hell, you would. You would do anything for that drop. And just think, for all eternity, you'll never, you'll experience that thirst and hunger. You never get to eat either. So these are all things that you have to experience in hell forever. See, all good things come from God, James 1.17 says. So all the good we enjoy in life, the fresh air, sunshine, fellowship, drinking, eating, sleeping, all the good comes from God. It's not automatic. God's the one giving us this goodness. 
Psalms 33, 5 says the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. We get to enjoy his goodness here in life. But if you reject him, then you go to a place that is absent from his attributes and his goodness. You know, I, he showed me a puff of smoke come up. And I said, Lord, what's that? He said, that's your life. Life is but a vapor, James 4, 14. I thought, that's it? It was just a little puff of smoke, like a tea kettle. You know, when you see the little go up real fast? That was a whole life, 100 years or so. I thought, Lord, that's it? We don't have much time. He said, yes, but what you do for me during that short time, I will count for all eternity. Isn't that exciting? I thought, wow, you mean that little bit of puff of smoke, you will remember everything we do for you forever? Yeah, for all eternity. He put it in a book. That gave me an eternal perspective. You know, we get so tied up on things that we think are important in life, but they're really not. The things that are important are things that will last forever. And one of those things is to win souls. Because that's God's heart. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. So we need to have a piece of his heart in us. And we'll be bold enough to go and share the gospel. Because the only thing you can take to heaven is people. Now it does say your works will follow you. Well, part of your works are winning souls, you know. And so just encourage you to be a soul winner, you know. Jesus told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's not a suggestion. That was a command. And Proverbs 11.30 says, He that wins souls is wise. We all want more wisdom. That's one of the ways you get it is by being a soul winner. You know? And I just want to share with you, just to encourage you to be a soul winner. I'm just going to share with you two quick stories. One is um, I used to witness, try to witness a little bit to my neighbor. Uh, he was an ex-Marine, tough, burry, big, stocky guy. And uh, he, did, he was an atheist. He would not hear anything about God. I tried here and there over the years. No, not interested. He, was, he owned a car dealership. He was just a tough guy. Anyway, I found out one day that he was in a hospital dying. So I asked his wife, can I go visit him? My wife and I go visit him. And she says, yeah, but don't mention the Bible to him. He does not like to hear anything about God or the Bible. Now, she was not a Christian either, but she just made sure I knew that. And I said, I know, I know how he is. And uh, she didn't want to hear it either, but I'm surprised she even said that. But anyway, so we went, my wife and I took the time, went up there to see him. When we got into the hospital room, he had tears coming down his face, and he looked, had the most terrified look on his face. I said, what's wrong? And he said, Bill, last night, I almost died. I was slipping out of my body, and I was going into a really dark place. He said, I have never been scared. I was terrified. Please, can you help me? I said, well, I think you know where you were going. You were going to hell. And he goes, yeah, I don't want to go there. How do I stay out? So we led him to the Lord. We said, he said the prayer. He was so excited to say it. He wept. And now a peace came over him after he said the prayer. And he didn't want to let us go. He held our hand for a long time. We stayed as long as we could. And then we finally left him. And he and I assured him, you're going to heaven. You don't have to fear anything now. Well, I think it was about a week later he died. So a couple points. What if my wife and I wouldn't have taken the effort to go? He had no friends that were Christians. His own wife wasn't saved. He probably would have gone to hell. That might have been one of those places where Ezekiel 33, 8 says, if you fail to speak to warn the sinner from his way, his blood will I require at your hand. God's saying, I hold you partially accountable if you don't go. Now, that doesn't mean every single person you're supposed to witness to, but when God speaks to you and tells you go and witness to and you don't do it, God says he's going to hold us accountable. And it says the same thing in Acts 20, 26 and Acts 18, 6. Paul said, I'm free from the blood of all men because I have not shunned to declare unto you the full gospel. So Paul knew you needed to preach the gospel. He says, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. That's all of our jobs. And so that's what I just want to encourage you to do. And uh, I was so glad that the man that we went and he got saved and now he's going to heaven. Praise the Lord. And his wife, his wife is still alive today and still is not saved. You know, I tried to tell her that we went and talked to her husband and she she just didn't even want to hear it. It's so strange, you know, how people get so hardened. And just one more story quickly to share with you, and this is powerful to me. We went to New Jersey to speak at a church, and um, it was a small church. Anyway, at the end of the service, after the altar call, and people came forward and all that, we were at the book table, and two women came up at the book table, and one was um, 
weeping. She's a very sharp looking lady in a nice suit in her 30s. Uh, but she was just weeping, and she couldn't even talk. The other friend said, Bill, I've got to tell you what happened. She says, last night at my home, I was home, and I received a call from my friend here. And she said, uh, I've, I'm going to kill myself tonight. I'm done. I'm, I've just had it. I'm finished. She said, I knew she was serious. I know it's my best friend, and I knew she was done. She'd been through a lot of tough stuff, and she was determined to kill herself that night. I said to her, Please don't do that yet. Come over to my home and see me once for, before you do this. So she, she agreed. She came over, which was, she was surprised. But she came over and she said, listen, before you do this, I want you to read this book that I just read. And she gave her 23 Minutes in Hell, my book. She said, you sit down and read this book before you kill yourself. And she says, okay. So she sat down and started reading it. As she's reading it, I guess about 45 minutes later or so, the phone rang. And a friend called the lady of the home, and she says, hey, are you going to church tomorrow? And she goes, yeah, why? And she goes, well, this guy's coming to speak. He's talking about hell. This guy, Bill Weiss, is speaking on hell tomorrow. She goes, Bill Weiss is at our little church tomorrow? And she goes, yeah, yeah. She goes, I didn't know that. And she goes, oh, you're kidding. So she hung up the phone and told the lady that was reading the book, said, you won't believe it, but the author of that book is going to be at my little church tomorrow morning speaking. You can't kill yourself tonight, okay? Well, give it a day. Wait till tomorrow. So she agreed. And she came the next morning. And she came forward and got saved. She gave her heart to Jesus. She was the one weeping. And she said, Bill, I would have been in hell last night if it wasn't for you coming here in your book. But my point is to make, look at the orchestration that this took for God. Because, first of all, the pastor had called us to book us a year earlier. So that day, we were coming, a year later. Then that night, this lady calls her friend and says, I'm going to commit suicide tonight. Then her friend says, don't do it. Come over and, and see me first. She agreed to do that. That's something, because a lot of times people say, no, I'm just going to kill myself. She came over. Then she agreed to read a book that this lady happened to read, my book. Happened to have it and give her and have her read it. And she agreed to read it. Then her friend calls her. And says, are you going to church tomorrow? Because Bill Weiss is coming. So God had to have her friend call, right? To call and tell her because she wouldn't have known. So now she says to her friend that was going to kill herself, you got to come tomorrow because Bill Weiss is going to be at my church tomorrow morning. What is the chance of that happening? So God had to orchestrate all those things because he's interested in everybody getting saved. Isn't that amazing that God would do that? We serve a good God, and He's orchestrating these things all over the earth. And so as soul winners, if we're willing to be obedient and witness, God's orchestrating all these things for you ahead of time. It's all prepared and all laid out. All you have to do is say, Lord, use me. Send me today. And God will put somebody in front of you. He'll work it out. He'll have you go drive to a certain place. I just feel like I'm supposed to go here today. And you go and you end up, you know, God works out all these details if you're willing and then you're rewarded in heaven for this. This is how we get the rewards, bringing people. So it, I just encourage you, be a soul winner. Every one of us are. You can share your testimony. You don't have to know the whole Bible. Just know a couple scriptures and your own testimony, what God's done for you. I talked to one other atheist real quickly, and this atheist was a multimillionaire businessman, and I shared everything I could with him and trying to convince him, and he would not listen. And at the end, he just said, you know what? I am just not interested. Not interested. And God brought to my memory something I had read earlier. I said, you know, if I was to give you, offer you a cup of cold water or a hundred million dollars, which would you take? You would take the hundred million dollars, right? Absolutely. I said, but say now you were in the desert, you're dying. You have 30 seconds to live because you're dying of thirst. And I offer you the hundred million dollars or the cup of cold water, which would you take? You take the cup of cold water. It's called circumstantial priorities. I said, see, there's going to come a day when you're going to stand before the throne of God with all his millions of angels and all his mighty power before his almighty throne. You're going to stand there and he's going to say to you, why didn't you believe my word? Why didn't you believe that Jesus was the only way and paid for your sins? You'll have no excuse 
and you'll be desperate, frantic for that offer of salvation, that cup of cold water. But you won't get that offer then. It'll be too late. And that's what people do. They turn down that cup of cold water, that offer of salvation, because they don't see a value in it. But there's going to come a day where they're going to see that value. But it'll be too late for them now. Maybe you're here today. I don't know. And you would say, Bill, I don't know if I'm even saved. I, maybe I don't know if I've ever really repented. You know, Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, unless a man repent, you shall all likewise perish. We have to repent and turn away from a sinful lifestyle and agree to follow Jesus. That's the only way to heaven. You can't just mentally assent to the fact and say, yeah, I believe Jesus is God. I believe that. And just go do your own thing. That's not repentance. It takes a humble heart to admit, man, I'm a sinner. I'm going to hell without Jesus, and I need him. And I'm willing to turn away from sin and follow Jesus. That's a repented heart. And in Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God's raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. You have to believe it in your own heart and confess him with your own mouth. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. You want to live at his house, you do it his way. But God actually does have a book. Revelation 20, 15 says, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So my question for you today is, do you know if your name's written in this book? Are you certain? You need to be positive on this one. If there's any doubt in your mind, I'm going to ask you at the count of three to slip up your hand. If you're not certain, you can be certain. 